You've waited all week for it, and now it's time to wind down and chill with Grit Daily. Hey everyone, welcome to Wind Down and Chill, and we've got a really special guest today. We've got Kathleen Inman of Inman Family Wines, and she's not only focused on sustainability, but she produces some of the best Pinot Noirs in the area. And we've got Kathleen actually standing live in her vineyard right now to come to talk to us. Hey Kathleen. Hi there, how are you? We're great. I know it's a little earlier over there in California and how the uh, vineyard's doing so far this summer. Yeah, so, I've, so I have a sort of routine at this time of year as we're um, heading up towards harvest at the um, end of August, beginning of September. So I'm pretty much once a week checking in on the vineyards and I'm at Pratt Vine Hill Vineyard, which is in the Laguna Ridge uh, neighborhood of the Russian River Valley in Sonoma County. So it's just uh, the grapes are going through verasion. That's the process where they are turning from green to eventually to black because this is Pinot Noir vineyard. And they're all a sort of uh, bronzy purple right now with little tinges of green. So I'm just uh, going through looking to see where things need to be, um, where things are too crowded and fruit needs to be dropped or where tractors have maybe damaged canes and so the, there won't be enough leaves to properly ripen the fruit so we'll drop those and so I'm just going through making notes taking pictures and uh, getting the crew to come back in and uh, make some uh, adjustments. Well you, we're going to jump right in there you talked about a harvest at the end of August now from what I've read about you it sounds like you've been kind of ahead of that curve and picking your grapes earlier than your neighbors all the time can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, it's not all of the time, but I, I jokingly refer to myself as a grape groper. I go around and um, I'm feeling the grapes as they get riper for, and not just testing the sugar. Like, you know, most people are picking their grapes based on the level of sugar in the grapes, the bricks as we measure it. But I pick much more on taste and because I'm looking, I try very hard to make wines as naturally as I can. And that means not adding water to reduce the alcohol or adding acid. So acid is really important for wines that are food friendly. And that's what I, you know, my goal is to make wines that, that pair well with food and have a sort of, you know, bright, refreshing sort of character. And so I want to pick when the acid is high and that may be when the sugar is higher. So sometimes the alcohol, you know, sometimes the grapes retain their acidity even though they're increasing the sugar and that's okay my goal isn't low alcohol wines my my goal is balanced wines that have the right amount of acidity so that often means i am picking a bit earlier than other people um because i'm not waiting for some particular um you know number on the um, brick scale i am looking for when they taste good now, you produce a number of Pinot Noirs and some rosé, and including some bubbly versions. I'm a big fan of pink bubbles. Can you tell us which of the wines you produce? Which one's your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Well, I used to always, so when I started, I was just making estate wines. So I had, I grow Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir at my Olivet Grange Vineyard. So the OGV estate. And so I used to joke that asking me to choose a favorite was like asking me to choose between my blonde daughter and my redheaded daughter. But now that I make a lot of wines, <laughs> it is easier to choose. And I am a huge fan of my, um, my estate vineyard. So that's what I make my Endless Crush Rosé from, as well as the estate Pinot Noir and the Brut Rosé that you mentioned. Um, so... It's more of a, having a favorite vineyard as opposed to a particular wine. Now, as far as getting to that, you know, sort of rolling things back a bit, you spent 15 years in the UK in finance, but you went there already with an established affinity for wine, having, from what I've yes. read, met your husband as a, you were offering wine tastings and working in a winery. How, how many years did it take until you really started to feel that pull that you must return to California? And do something with wines. Was it the whole? Well, I th no. Um, it's funny. Um, I mean, I love living in England, and I'm a passionate gardener. And England is just 
the best place to be gardening. It was really when we were having a family holiday here in California in 1997 that after visiting my family in Napa and my husband's had has family that were in uh, here in Sonoma County, uh, we went up to Mendocino and we were having a bottle of wine after we put the children to bed in the hotel, you know, hotel. And we were saying, maybe we should just, you know, maybe we should just give everything up in the UK. My husband is a, an attorney and um, I was a, a headhunter at the time. And uh, maybe we should just give it up and we could come back to California and, you know, grow grapes. I would, didn't really initially think about making wine. I was much more on the on the farming side and but then once we got here because we made this crazy decision and moved here in uh, May of 1998 and then bought the land for Olivet Grange Vineyard in 99 that I finally decided you know instead of just making grapes I think I'm going to create a wine brand and that's when uh, we created Inman Family Wines. UK, though, isn't really renowned for sustainability. Why did this become such an important aspect of all that you do at Inman Family Wines? Well, I think that's something I've always been interested in, even when I was a, a child, you know, in the, in the 70s, I was interested in, you know, recycling and um, ecology, as we, uh, as we called it then. And when I moved to England, I wanted to do all my gardening organically. And so I sort of taught myself about composting and about, and I had a worm farm and, uh, you know, worm teas and things like that. It just seemed to be me very natural that when we came back, or when I came back to California, when we all came to California, that we would, you know, that I put, I call it my eco-ethics, the things I believe in, that I'd put it to work in, in my business. So one of the things that I'm always curious about, as I said, you know, I, I love pink bubbles and they're really catching on. Do your male clients enjoy them or do they eschew them? Because, oh, Rosé is for women. So what's that reaction? Well, I think, I think they're equally enjoyed. I don't think there's a, um, the particular ones that I do, it's, they're quite, you know, low dosage. So they're on the dry, very dry side and they're really beautiful. Um, I find there there's no sort of gender bias towards my root rosé. Okay. And we know that you've been having virtual happy hours with your Meet the Maker. How have those been received? Oh, I've been having so much fun doing these uh, virtual happy hours. Um, it's, and I think it's, uh, I don't know, it's been a wonderful way to um, meet new people, but also um, companies have really been enjoying them. So I've been doing a lot of corporate wine tastings where people are either entertaining their customers or using it for team building. And so Inman Family Wines sends out um, trios that I created of wines that have different themes. And then we, um, I take people out into the vineyard, which I think most people doing these virtual tastings are not actually doing. We go into the vineyard and we look at what's happening, um, um, uh, you know, actually in the vineyard. And um, then we come back into the winery and, uh, and sit down and taste pretty much like we would if we were, if people were actually visiting me at the, at the winery. Um, it's been great fun. I think I've met over a thousand people so far. It's crazy. Oh, and, and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> the spreadsheet is, is enormous. And I've got probably, you know, most days this, this week and the next three weeks, I've got three tastings a day. So burning questions that I have is that you, you know, took out very early. You've got premium wines and you chose to use the Stelvin screw caps. So did consumers lament the loss of ritual, you know, like opening a screw cap wine? And what was that initial reaction? Yeah, well, I was, Inman was the first luxury brand uh, to start a new brand, all screw cap, back in 2002. So for me, I've been doing it so long that I don't really even think about it. Um, sure, in the... Uh, around between 2002 and 2005 um, I had to sometimes explain to people why I was doing it but I found 
over the um, over the years that there's been uh, you know a lot less issue and people actually collect my wines and they age fantastically well with the screw cap. I use less sulfur dioxide in the winemaking and there's no need to put an extra bump of um, of SO2 into the wines when bottling, which you normally have to do with a cork. So I'm ending up using usually 30 to 40 percent less sulfur than um, uh, dioxide than most uh, wines. Um, I love that each bottle is consistent because of the the uniformity of the closure, whereas corks vary a lot in their porosity and they let in different amounts of oxygen, so they then impact the wines differently. And um, and of course, it's very easy to open. No special tools required. And uh, I think that's always nice as well. And there's, you know, and the, the real reason I started in 2002 was there was just such a high percentage of uh, wines that were corked. Um, that is, they were uh, damaged by the TCA um, in the cork and takes away the flavor you know, adds either bad flavor or sort of mutes the fruit or makes it taste like grandma's basement. And um, so I, you know, there's a multitude of reasons why they are superior and especially for the style of wines that I'm making. Now, one other question. So you're a bit of a contrarian in the sense, but you're also one of a, you know, growing number, small still though, of female vintners and, and wineries. So what advice would you want to share to other women who are considering a similar path? It's a, a tough path if you um, are coming up through traditional, you know, traditional methods of joining, joining larger wineries and working in the cellar or, or joining the lab and trying to get on to the winemaking side. But I think working with smaller um, wineries is a, as, a, as a target is a, is a good thing for, for, for women personally, where you can find mentors and you can work with those mentors to help you move up in your career. Um, you know, there is, I think it's still about just under 10% of lead winemakers are women. And, you know, a lot of those women are like me, they have their own businesses. Um, they're either consulting or they have their own wine brands. And that's very often because there's a bit of a ceiling in getting getting to the lead winemaking positions in many wineries. So, you know, what's it like to be a woman winemaker? And since I've never been a man <laughs> as a winemaker, <laughs> I really can't answer that question. And it's, um, I wish, I think it's, you know, with all that's happening in the world and global warming and all those things, things that are happening because of all the pollution that we've created and effects on the environment that minimizing our, our footprint is a, is a good thing to do. Absolutely. 100%. Well, thank you for talking with me today. And I, um, it's the first time I've done a, um, uh, interview in this vineyard. Um, usually I'm in, um, the Olivet Grange and this is the Pratt Vine Hill vineyard. So a little bit of a different location. <laughs> oh, there you go. I have a little fun with that. Follow us at Grit Daily on social media and listen to all of our podcasts, including Like a Boss on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, or your favorite platform. For special guest submissions, email Laura Lynn at gritdaily.com.